Section 10 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations. Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations, by John Lord. Ancient Philosophy, Part 2. Nevertheless, these great men, lofty as were their inquiries and blameless their lives, had not established any system nor any theories which were incontrovertible. They had simply speculated, and the world ridiculed their speculations. Their ideas were one-sided, and when pushed out to their extreme logical sequence, were antagonistic to one another, which had a tendency to produce doubt and skepticism. Men denied the existence of the gods, and the grounds of certainty fell away from the human mind. This spirit of skepticism was favored by the tide of worldliness and prosperity which followed the Persian War. Athens became a great center of art, of taste, of elegance, and of wealth. Politics absorbed the minds of the people. Glory and splendor were followed by corruption of morals and the pursuit of material pleasures. Philosophy went out of fashion since it brought no outward and tangible good. More scientific studies were pursued, those which could be applied to purposes of utility and material gains. Even as in our day geology, chemistry, mechanics, engineering have reference to the practical wants of men, command talent, and lead to certain reward. In Athens, rhetoric, mathematics, and natural history supplanted rhapsodies and speculations on God and providence. Renown and wealth could be secured only by readiness and felicity of speech, and that was most valued which brought immediate recompense, like eloquence. Men began to practice eloquence as an art and to employ it in furthering their interests. They made special pleadings, since it was their object to gain their point at any expense of law and justice. Hence they taught that nothing was immutably right, but only so by convention. They undermined all confidence in truth and religion by teaching its uncertainty. They denied to men even the capability of arriving at truth. They practically affirmed the cold and cynical doctrine that there is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink. Qui bono, that is, the cry of most men in periods of great outward prosperity, was the popular inquiry. Who will show us any good? How can we become rich, strong, and honorable? This was the spirit of that class of public teachers who arose in Athens when art and eloquence and wealth and splendor were at their height in the 5th century before Christ, and when the elegant Pericles was the leader of fashion and of political power. These men were the sophists, rhetorical men, who taught the children of the rich, worldly men who sought honor and power, frivolous men trifling with philosophical ideas, skeptical men denying all certainty and truth, men who as teachers added nothing to the realm of science, but who yet established certain dialectical rules useful to later philosophers. They were a wealthy, powerful, honored class, not much esteemed by men of thought, but sought out as very successful teachers of rhetoric, and also generally selected as ambassadors on difficult missions. They were full of logical tricks, and contrived to throw ridicule upon profound inquiries. They taught also mathematics, astronomy, philology, and natural history with success. They were polished men of society, not profound nor religious, but very brilliant as talkers, and very ready in wit and sophistry. And some of them were men of great learning and talent, like Democritus, Lucippus, and Georgius. They were not pretenders and quacks. They were skeptics who denied subjective truths and labored for outward advantage. They taught the art of disputation and sought systematic methods of proof. They thus prepared the way for a more perfect philosophy than that taught by the Ionians, the Pythagoreans, or the Eletics, since they showed the vagueness of such inquiries, conjectural rather than scientific. They had no doctrines in common. They were the barristers of their age, paid to make the worse appear the better reason, yet not teachers of immorality any more than the lawyers of our day, men of talents, the intellectual leaders of society. If they did not advance positive truths, they were useful in the method they created. They had no hostility to truth as such. They only doubted whether it could be reached in the realm of psychological inquiries and sought to apply knowledge to their own purposes, or rather to distort it in order to gain a case. They are not a class of men whom I admire, as I do the old sages they ridiculed, but they were not without their use in the development of philosophy. The sophists also rendered a service to literature by giving definiteness to language and creating style in prose writing. Protagoras investigated the principles of accurate composition, 
Prodicus busied himself with inquiries into the significance of words. Georgius, like Voltaire, gloried in a captivating style and gave symmetry to the structure of sentences. The ridicule and skepticism of the sophists brought out the great powers of Socrates, to whom philosophy is probably more indebted than to any man who ever lived, not so much for a perfect system as for the impulse he gave to philosophical inquiries and for his successful exposure of error. He inaugurated a new era. Born in Athens in the year 470 BC, the son of a poor sculptor, he devoted his life to the search after truth for its own sake and sought to base it on immutable foundations. He was the mortal enemy of the sophists whom he encountered, as Pascal did the Jesuits, with wit, irony, puzzling questions, and remorseless logic. It is true that Socrates and his great successors, Plato and Aristotle, were called sophists, but only as all philosophers or wise men were so called. The sophists, as a class, had incurred the odium of being the first teachers who received pay for the instruction they imparted. The philosophers generally taught for the love of truth. The sophists were a natural and necessary and very useful development of their time, but they were distinctly on a lower level than the philosophers, or lovers of wisdom. Like the earlier philosophers, Socrates disdained wealth, ease, and comfort, but with greater devotion than they, since he lived in a more corrupt age, when poverty was a disgrace and misfortune a crime, when success was the standard of merit, and every man was supposed to be the arbiter of his own fortune, ignoring that providence who so often refuses the race to the swift and the battle to the strong. He was what in our time would be called eccentric. He walked barefooted, meanly clad, and withal not over cleanly, seeking public places, disputing with everybody willing to talk with him, making everybody ridiculous, especially if one assumed airs of wisdom or knowledge, an exasperating opponent, since he wove a web around a man from which he could not be extricated, and then exposed him to ridicule in the wittiest city of the world. He attacked everybody, and yet was generally respected, since it was errors rather than persons, opinions rather than vices, that he attacked and this he did with bewitching eloquence and irresistible fascination, so that though he was poor and barefooted, a salinous in appearance, with thick lips, upturned nose, projecting eyes, unwieldy belly, he was sought by Alcibiades and admired in Aspasia. Even Xanthippe, a beautiful young woman, very much younger than he, a woman fond of the comforts and pleasures of life, was willing to marry him, although it is said that she turned out a scolding wife after the res angusta domi had disenchanted her from the music of his voice and the divinity of his nature. I have heard Pericles, said the most dissipated and voluptuous man in Athens, and other excellent orators, but was not moved by them, while this Marsyas, the satyr, so affects me that the life I lead is hardly worth living and I stop my ears from the sirens, and flee as fast as possible, that I may not sit down and grow old in listening to his talk. Socrates learned his philosophy from no one, and struck out on an entirely new path. He declared his own ignorance, and sought to convince other people of theirs. He did not seek to reveal truth so much as to expose error, and yet it was his object to attain correct ideas as to moral obligations. He proclaimed the sovereignty of virtue and the immutability of justice. He sought to delineate and enforce the practical duties of life. His great object was the elucidation of morals, and he was the first to teach ethics systematically from the immutable principles of moral obligation. Moral certitude was the lofty platform from which he surveyed the world, and upon which, as a rock, he rested in the storms of life. Thus he was a great reformer and a moralist. It was his ethical doctrines which were most antagonistic to the age and the least appreciated. He was a profoundly religious man, recognized providence, and believed in the immortality of the soul. He did not presume to inquire into the divine essence, yet he believed the gods were omniscient and omnipresent, that they ruled by the law of goodness, and that in spite of their multiplicity there was unity, a supreme intelligence that governed the world. Hence he was hated by the sophists, who denied the certainty of arriving at any knowledge of God. From the comparative worthlessness of the body he deduced the immortality of the soul. With him the end of life was reason and intelligence. He deduced the existence of God from the order and harmony of nature, belief in which was irresistible. He endeavored to connect the moral with the religious consciousness, and thus to promote the practical welfare of society. In this light, Socrates stands out the greatest personage of pagan antiquity, as a moralist, as a teacher of ethics, as a man who recognized the divine. So far as he was concerned in the development of Greek philosophy proper, he was inferior to some of his disciples. 
Yet he gave a turning point to a new period when he wakened the idea of knowledge, and was the founder of the method of scientific inquiry, since he pointed out the legitimate bounds of inquiry and was thus the precursor of Bacon and Pascal. He did not attempt to make physics explain metaphysics, nor metaphysics the phenomena of the natural world, and he reasoned only from what was generally assumed to be true and invariable. He was a great pioneer of philosophy, since he resorted to inductive methods of proof, and gave general definiteness to ideas. Although he employed induction, it was his aim to withdraw the mind from the contemplation of nature, and to fix it on its own phenomena, to look inward rather than outward, a method carried out admirably by his pupil, Plato. The previous philosophers had given their attention to external nature. Socrates gave up speculations about material phenomena, and directed his inquiries solely to the nature of knowledge. And as he considered knowledge to be identical with virtue, he speculated on ethical questions, mainly, and the method which he taught was that by which alone man could become better and wiser. To know oneself, in other words, that the proper study of mankind is man, he proclaimed with Thales. Cicero said of him, Socrates brought down philosophy from the heavens to the earth. He did not disdain the subjects which chiefly interested the sophists, astronomy, rhetoric, physics, but he chiefly discussed moral questions such as what is piety, what is the just and the unjust, what is temperance, what is courage, what is the character fit for a citizen, and other ethical points involving practical human relationships. These questions were discussed by Socrates in a striking manner and by a method peculiarly his own. Professing ignorance, he put perhaps this question, what is law? It was familiar and was answered offhand. Socrates, having got the answer, then put fresh questions applicable to specific cases, to which the respondent was compelled to give an answer inconsistent with the first, thus showing that the definition was too narrow or too wide or defective in some essential condition. The respondent then amended his answer, but this was a prelude to other questions, which could only be answered in ways inconsistent with the amendment, and the respondent, after many attempts to disentangle himself, was obliged to plead guilty to his inconsistencies, with an admission that he could make no satisfactory answer to the original inquiry which had at first appeared so easy. Thus, by this system of cross-examination, he showed the intimate connection between the dialectic method and the logical distribution of particulars into species and genera. The discussion first turns upon the meaning of some generic term. The query bring the answers into collision with various particulars which it ought not to comprehend, or which it ought to comprehend but does not. Socrates broke up the one into many by his analytical string of questions, which was a mode of argument by which he separated real knowledge from the conceit of knowledge, and led to precision in the use of definitions. It was thus that he exposed the false, without aiming even to teach the true, for he generally professed ignorance on his part, and put himself in the attitude of a learner, while by his cross-examinations he made the man from whom he apparently sought knowledge to appear as ignorant as himself, or still worse, absolutely ridiculous. Thus Socrates pulled away all the foundations on which a false science had been erected, and indicated the mode by which alone the true could be established. Here he was not unlike Bacon, who pointed out the way whereby science could be advanced, without founding any school or advocating any system. But the Athenian was unlike Bacon in the object of his inquiries. Bacon was disgusted with ineffective logical speculations, and Socrates with ineffective physical researches. He never suffered a general term to remain undetermined, but applied it at once to particulars, and by questions the purport of which was not comprehended. It was not by positive teaching, but by exciting scientific impulse in the minds of others, or stirring up the analytical faculties, that Socrates manifested originality. It was his aim to force the seekers after truth into the path of inductive generalization, whereby alone trustworthy conclusions could be formed. He thus struck out from his own and other minds that fire which sets light to original thought and stimulates analytical inquiry. He was a religious and intellectual missionary, preparing the way for the Plato's and Aristotle's of the succeeding age by his severe dialectics. This was his mission, and he declared it by talking. He did not lecture, he conversed. For more than thirty years he discoursed on the principles of morality, until he arrayed against himself enemies who caused him to be put to death, for his teachings had undermined the popular system which the sophists accepted and practiced. He probably might have been acquitted if he had chosen to be, but he did not wish to live after his powers of usefulness had passed away. The service which Socrates rendered to philosophy, as enumerated by Tenemen, are twofold, 
negative and positive negative inasmuch as he avoided all vain discussions combated mere speculative reasoning on substantial grounds and had the wisdom to acknowledge ignorance when necessary but without attempting to determine accurately what is capable and what is not of being accurately known positive inasmuch as he examined with great ability the ground directly submitted to our understanding and of which man is the center socrates cannot be said to have founded a school like xenophanes he did not bequeath a system of doctrines he had however his disciples who followed in the path which he suggested among these were aristippus antisthenes euclid of megara phaedo of elis and plato all of whom were pupils of socrates and founders of the schools some only partially adopted his method and each differed from the other nor can it be said that all of them advanced science aristippus the founder of the cyrenaic school was a sort of philosophic voluptuary teaching that pleasure is the end of life antisthenes the founder of the cynics was both virtuous and arrogant placing the supreme good in virtue but despising speculative science and maintaining that no man can refute the opinions of another he made it a virtue to be ragged hungry and cold like the ancient monks an austere stern bitter reproachful man who affected to despise all pleasures like his own disciple diogenes who lived in a tub and carried on a war between the body and mind brutal scornful proud to men who maintain that science was impossible philosophy is not much indebted although they were disciples of socrates euclid not the mathematician who was about a century later merely gave a new edition of the eleatic doctrines and phaedo speculated on the oneness of the good it was not till plato arose that a more complete system of philosophy was founded he was born of noble athenian parents 429 bc the year that pericles died in the second year of the peloponnesian war the most active period of greek thought he had a severe education studying mathematics poetry music rhetoric and blending these with philosophy he was only twenty when he found out socrates with whom he remained ten years and from whom he was separated only by death he then went on his travels visiting everything worth seeing in his day especially in egypt when he returned he began to teach the doctrines of his master which he did like him gratuitously in a garden near athens planted with lofty plane trees and adorned with temples and statues this was called the academy and gave a name to his system of philosophy it is this only with which we have to do it is not the calm serious meditative isolated man that i would present but his contribution to the developments of philosophy on the principles of his master surely no man ever made a richer contribution to this department of human inquiry than plato he may not have had the originality or keenness of socrates but he was more profound he was preeminently a great thinker a great logician skilled in dialectics and his dialogues are such perfect exercises of the dialectical method that the ancients were divided as to whether he was a skeptic or a dogmatist he adopted the socratic method and enlarged it says Luz, analysis as insisted on by plato is the decomposition of the whole into its separate parts is seeing the one in many the individual thing was transitory the abstract idea was eternal only concerning the latter could philosophy occupy itself socrates insisting on proper definitions had no conception of the classification of those definitions which must constitute philosophy plato by the introduction of this process shifted philosophy from the ground of inquiries into man in society which exclusively occupied socrates to that of dialectics plato was also distinguished for skill in composition dionysus of Halicarnassus classes him with herodotus and demosthenes in the perfection of his style which is characterized by great harmony and rhythm as well as by a rich variety of elegant metaphors plato made philosophy to consist in the discussion of general terms or abstract ideas general terms were synonymous with real existences and these were the only objects of philosophy these were called ideas and ideas are the basis of his system or rather the subject matter of dialectics he maintained that every general term or abstract idea has a real and independent existence nay that the mental power of conceiving and combining ideas as contrasted with the mere impressions received from matter and external phenomena is the only real and permanent existence hence his writings became the great fountainhead of the ideal philosophy in his assertion of the real existence of so abstract and supersensuous a thing as an idea he was probably indebted to pythagoras for plato was a master of the whole realm of philosophical speculation 
but his conception of ideas as the essence of being is a great advance on that philosopher's conception of numbers he was taught by socrates that beyond this world of sense there is the world of eternal truth and that there are certain principles concerning which there can be no dispute the soul apprehends the idea of goodness greatness etc it is in the celestial world that we are to find the realm of ideas now god is the supreme idea to know god then should be the great aim of life we know him through the desire which like feels for like the divinity within feels its affinity with the divinity revealed in beauty or any other abstract idea the longing of the soul for beauty is love love then is the bond which unites the human with the divine Beauty is not revealed by harmonious outlines that appeal to the senses, but is truth. It is divinity. Beauty, truth, love, these are God, whom it is the supreme desire of the soul to comprehend, and by the contemplation of whom the mortal soul sustains itself. Knowledge of God is the great end of life, and this knowledge is affected by dialectics, for only out of dialectics can correct knowledge come. But man, immersed in the flux of sensualities, can never fully attain this knowledge of God, the object of all rational inquiry. Hence the imperfection of all human knowledge. The supreme good is attainable, it is not attained. God is the immutable good, and justice the rule of the universe. The vital principle of Plato's philosophy, says Ritter, is to show that true science is the knowledge of the good, is the eternal contemplation of truth or ideas and though man may not be able to apprehend it in its unity because he is subject to the restraints of the body he is nevertheless permitted to recognize it imperfectly by calling to mind the eternal measure of existence by which he is in his origin connected to quote from ritter again when we review the doctrines of plato it is impossible to deny that they are pervaded with a grand view of life and the universe this is the noble thought which inspired him to say that god is the constant and immutable good the world is good in a state of becoming and the human soul that in and through which the good in the world is to be consummated in his sublimer conception he shows himself the worthy disciple of socrates while he adopted many of the opinions of his predecessors and gave due consideration to the results of the earlier philosophy he did not allow himself to be disturbed by the mass of conflicting theories but breathed into them the life-giving breath of unity he may have erred in his attempts to determine the nature of good still he pointed out to all who aspire to a knowledge of the divine nature an excellent road by which they may arrive at it that plato was one of the greatest lights of the ancient world there can be no reasonable doubt nor is it probable that as a dialectician he has ever been surpassed while his purity of life and his lofty inquiries and his belief in god and immortality make him in an ethical point of view the most worthy of the disciples of socrates he was to the greeks what kant was to the germans and these two great thinkers resemble each other in the structure of their minds and their relations to society the ablest part of the lectures of archer butler of dublin is devoted to the platonic philosophy it is at once a criticism and a eulogium no modern writer has written more enthusiastically of what he considers the crowning excellence of the greek philosophy the dialectics of plato his ideal theory his physics his psychology and his ethics are the most ably discussed and in the spirit of a loving and eloquent disciple Butler represents the philosophy which he so much admires as a contemplation of, and a tendency to, the absolute and eternal good. As the admirers of Ralph Waldo Emerson claim that he, more than any other man of our times, entered into the spirit of the Platonic philosophy, I introduce some of his most striking paragraphs of subdued but earnest admiration of the greatest intellect of the ancient pagan world, hoping that they may be clearer to others than they are to me. These sentences of Plato contain the culture of nations. These are the cornerstone of schools. These are the foundation head of literatures. A discipline it is in logic, arithmetic, taste, symmetry, poetry, language, rhetoric, ontology, morals, or practical wisdom. There never was such a range of speculation. Out of Plato came all things that are still written and debated among men of thought great havoc makes he among our originalities we have reached the mountain from which all these drift boulders were attached plato in egypt and in eastern pilgrimages imbibed the idea of one deity in which all things are absorbed 
the unity of asia and the detail of europe the infinitude of the asiatic soul and the defining result loving machine making surface seeking opera going europe plato came to join and by contact to enhance the energy of each the excellence of europe and asia is in his brain metaphysics and natural philosophy expressed the genius of europe he substricts the religion of asia as the base in short a balanced soul was born perceptive of the two elements the physical philosophers had sketched each his theory of the world the theory of atoms of fire of flux of spirit theories mechanical and chemical in their genius plato a master of mathematics studious of all natural laws and causes feels these as second causes to be no theories of the world but bare inventories and lists to the study of nature he therefore prefixes the dogma let us declare the cause which led the supreme ordainer to produce and compose the universe he was good he wished that all things should be as much as possible like himself plato represents the privilege of the intellect the power namely of carrying up every fact to successive platforms and so disclosing in every fact a germ of expansion these expansions or extensions consist in continuing the spiritual sight where the horizon falls on our natural vision and by this second sight discovering the long lines of law which shoot in every direction his definition of ideas as what is simple permanent uniform and self-existent forever discriminating them from the notions of the understanding marks an era in the world end of section 10 Section 11 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations. Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations, by John Lord. Ancient Philosophy, Part 3. The great disciple of Plato was Aristotle, and he carried on the philosophical movement which Socrates had started to the highest limit that it ever reached in the ancient world. He was born at Stagira, 384 B.C., and early evinced an insatiable thirst for knowledge. When Plato returned from Sicily, Aristotle joined his disciples at Athens, and was his pupil for seventeen years. On the death of Plato, he went on his travels and became the tutor of Alexander the Great, and in 335 B.C. returned to Athens after an absence of twelve years, and set up a school in the Lyceum. He taught while walking up and down the shady paths which surrounded it, from which habit he obtained the name of Peripatetic, which has clung to his name and philosophy. His school had a great celebrity, and from it proceeded illustrious philosophers, statesmen, historians, and orators. Aristotle taught for thirteen years, during which time he composed most of his greater works. He not only wrote on dialectics and logic, but also on physics in its various departments. His work on The History of Animals was deemed so important that his royal pupil Alexander presented him with 800 talents, an enormous sum, for the collection of materials. He also wrote on ethics and politics, history and rhetoric, pouring out letters, poems, and speeches, three-fourths of which are lost. He was one of the most voluminous writers of antiquity, and probably is the most learned man whose writings have come down to us nor has any one of the ancients exercised upon the thinking of succeeding ages so wide an influence he was an oracle until the revival of learning hegel says aristotle penetrated into the whole mass into every department of the universe of things and subjected to the comprehension its scattered wealth and the greater number of the philosophical sciences owe to him their separation and commencement he is also the father of the history of philosophy, since he gives an historical review of the way in which the subject has been hitherto treated by the earlier philosophers. Says Adolf Starr, Plato made the external world the region of the incomplete and bad, of the contradictory and the false, and recognized absolute truth only in the eternal immutable ideas. Aristotle laid down the proposition that the idea which cannot of itself fashion itself into reality is powerless, and has only a potential existence, and that it becomes a living reality only by realizing itself in a creative manner by means of its own energy. There can be no doubt as to Aristotle's marvelous power of systematizing. Collecting together all the results of ancient speculation, he so combined them into a coordinate system that for a thousand years he reigned supreme in the schools. From a literary point of view, Plato was doubtless his superior, but Plato was a poet, making philosophy divine and musical, while Aristotle's investigations spread over a far wider range. 
he differed from plato chiefly in relation to the doctrine of ideas without however resolving the difficulty which divided them as he made matter to be the eternal ground of phenomena he reduced the notion of it to a precision it never before enjoyed and established thereby a necessary element in human science but being bound to matter he did not soar as plato did into the higher regions of speculation nor did he entertain as lofty views of god or of immortality neither did he have as high an ideal of human life his definition of the highest good was a perfect practical activity in a perfect life with aristotle closed the great socratic movement in the history of speculation when socrates appeared there was a general prevalence of skepticism arising from the unsatisfactory speculations respecting nature he removed this skepticism by inventing a new method of investigation and by withdrawing the mind from the contemplation of nature to the study of man himself he bade men to look inward plato accepted his method but applied it more universally like socrates however ethics were the great subject of his inquiries to which physics were only subordinate the problem he sought to solve was the way to live like the deity he would contemplate truth as the great aim of life with aristotle ethics formed only one branch of attention his main inquiries were in reference to physics and metaphysics he thus by bringing these into the region of inquiry paved the way for a new epoch of skepticism both plato and aristotle taught that reason alone can form science but as we have said aristotle differed from his master respecting the theory of ideas he did not deny to ideas a subjective existence but he did deny that they have an objective existence he maintained that individual things alone exist and if individuals alone exist they can be known only by sensation sensation thus becomes the basis of knowledge plato made reason the basis of knowledge but aristotle made experience that basis plato directed man to the contemplation of ideas aristotle to the observation of nature instead of proceeding synthetically and dialectically like plato he pursues an analytic course his method is hence inductive the derivation of certain principles from a sum of given facts and phenomena it would seem that positive science began with aristotle since he maintained that experience furnishes the principles of every science but while his conception was just there was not at that time a sufficient amount of experience from which to generalize with effect it is only a most extensive and exhaustive examination of the accuracy of a proposition which will warrant secure reasoning upon it aristotle reasoned without sufficient certainty of the major premise of his syllogisms aristotle was the father of logic and hegel and kant think there has been no improvement upon it since his day this became to him the real organon of science he supposed it was not merely the instrument of thought but the instrument of investigation hence it was futile for purposes of discovery although important to aid processes of thought induction and syllogism are the two great features of his system of logic the one sets out from particulars already known to arrive at a conclusion the other sets out from some general principle to arrive at particulars the latter more particularly characterized his logic which he presented in sixteen forms the whole evincing much ingenuity and skill in construction and presenting at the same time a useful dialectical exercise the syllogistic process of reasoning would be incontrovertible if the general were better known than the particular but it is only by induction which proceeds from the world of experience that we reach the higher world of cognition thus aristotle made speculation subordinate to logical distinctions and his system when carried out by the medieval schoolmen led to a spirit of useless quibbling instead of interrogating nature they interrogated their own minds and no great discoveries were made from want of proper knowledge of the conditions of scientific inquiry the method of aristotle became fruitless for him but it was the key by which future investigators were enabled to classify and utilize their vastly greater collection of facts and materials though aristotle wrote in a methodical manner his writings exhibit great parsimony of language there is no fascination in his style it is without ornament and very condensed his merit consisted in great logical precision and scrupulous exactness in the employment of terms philosophy as a great system of dialectics as an analysis of the power and faculties of the mind as a method to pursue inquiries culminated in aristotle 
he completed the great fabric of which thales led the foundation the subsequent schools of philosophy directed attention to ethical and practical questions rather than to intellectual phenomena the skeptics like pyrrho had only negative doctrines and held in disdain those inquiries which sought to penetrate the mysteries of existence they did not believe that absolute truth was attainable by man and they attacked the prevailing systems with great plausibility they pointed out the uncertainty of things and the folly of striving to comprehend them the epicureans despised the investigations of philosophy since in their view these did not contribute to happiness the subject of their inquiries was happiness not truth what will promote this was the subject of their speculation epicurus born 342 bc contended that pleasure was happiness that pleasure should be sought not for its own sake but with a view to the happiness of life obtained by it he taught that happiness was inseparable from virtue and that its enjoyments should be limited he was adverse to costly pleasures and regarded contentedness with a little to be a great good he placed wealth not in great possessions but in few wants he sought to widen the domain of pleasure and narrow that of pain and regarded a passionless state of life as the highest nor did he dread death which was deliverance from misery as the buddhists think epicurus has been much misunderstood and his doctrines were subsequently perverted especially when the arts of life were brought into the service of luxury and a gross materialism was the great feature of society epicurus had much of the spirit of a practical philosopher although very little of the earnest cravings of a religious man he himself led a virtuous life because he thought it was wiser and better and more productive of happiness to be virtuous not because it was his duty his writings were very voluminous and in his tranquil garden he led a peaceful life of study and enjoyment his followers and they were numerous were led into luxury and effeminacy as was to be expected from a skeptical and irreligious philosophy the great principle of which was that whatever is pleasant should be the object of existence sir james mackintosh says to epicurus we owe the general concurrence of reflecting men in succeeding times in the important truth that men cannot be happy without a virtuous frame of mind and course of life a truth of inestimable value not peculiar to the epicureans but placed by their exaggerations in a stronger light a truth it must be added of less importance as a motive to right conduct than to the completeness of moral theory which however it is very far from solely constituting with that truth the epicureans blended another position that because virtue promotes happiness every act of virtue must be done in order to promote happiness of the agent although therefore he has the merit of having more strongly inculcated the connection of virtue with happiness yet his doctrine is justly charged with indisposing the mind to those exalted and generous sentiments without which no pure elevated bold or tender virtues can exist the stoics were a large and celebrated sect of philosophers but they added nothing to the domain of thought they created no system they invented no new method they were led into no psychological inquiries their inquiries were chiefly ethical and since ethics are a great part of the system of greek philosophy the stoics are well worthy of attention some of the greatest men of antiquity are numbered among them like seneca epictetus and marcus aurelius the philosophy they taught us was morality and this was eminently practical and also elevated the founder of this sect zeno was born it is supposed on the island of cyprus about the year 350 bc he was the son of wealthy parents but was reduced to poverty by misfortune he was so good a man and so profoundly revered by the athenians that they entrusted to him the keys of their citadel he lived in a degenerate age when skepticism and sensuality were eating out the life and vigor of grecian society when greek civilization was rapidly passing away when ancient creeds had lost their majesty and general levity and folly overspread the land deeply impressed with the prevailing laxity of morals and the absence of religion he lifted up his voice more as a reformer than as an inquirer after truth and taught for more than fifty years in a place called the stoa the porch which had once been the resort of the poets hence the name of his school he was chiefly absorbed with ethical questions although he studied profoundly the systems of the old philosophers the skeptics had attacked both perception and reason 
they had shown that perception is after all based upon appearance and appearance is not a certainty and they showed that reason is unable to distinguish between appearance and certainty since it had nothing but phenomena to build upon and since there is no criterion to apply to reason itself then they proclaimed philosophy a failure and without foundation but zeno taking a stand on common sense fought for morality as did buddha before him and long after him reed and Beatty, when they combated the skepticism of hume philosophy according to zeno and other stoics was ultimately connected with the duties of practical life the contemplation, meditation, and thought recommended by Plato and Aristotle seemed only a covert recommendation of selfish enjoyment. The wisdom which it should be the aim of life to attain is virtue, and virtue is to live harmoniously with nature. To live harmoniously with nature is to exclude all personal ends, hence pleasure is to be disregarded, and pain is to be despised. And as all moral action must be in harmony with nature, the law of destiny is supreme and all things move according to immutable fate with the predominant tendency to the universal which characterized their system the stoics taught that the sage ought to regard himself as a citizen of the world rather than of any particular city or state they made four things to be indispensable to virtue a knowledge of good and evil which is the province of the reason temperance a knowledge of the due regulation of sensual passions fortitude a conviction that it is good to suffer what is necessary and justice or acquaintance with what ought to be every individual they made perfection necessary to virtue hence the severity of their system the perfect sage according to them is raised above all influence of external events he submits to the law of destiny he is exempt from desire and fear joy or sorrow he is not governed even by what he is exposed to necessarily like sorrow and pain he is free from the restraints of passion he is like a god in his mental placidity nor must the sage live only for himself but for others also he is a member of the whole body of mankind he ought to marry and to take part in public affairs but he is to attack error and vice with uncompromising sternness and will never weakly give way to compassion or forgiveness yet with this ideal the stoics were forced to admit that virtue like true knowledge although theoretically attainable is practically beyond the reach of man they were discontented with themselves and with all around them and looked upon all institutions as corrupt they had a profound contempt for their age and for what modern society calls success in life but it cannot be denied that they practiced a lofty and stern virtue in their degenerate times their god was made subject to fate and he was a material god synonymous with nature thus their system was pantheistic but they maintained the dignity of reason and sought to attain to virtues which it is not in the power of man to fully reach zeno lived to the extreme old age of ninety-eight although his constitution was not strong he retained his powers by great abstemiousness living chiefly on figs honey and bread he was a modest and retiring man seldom mingling with a crowd or admitting the society of more than two or three friends at a time he was as plain in his dress as he was frugal in his habits a man of great decorum and propriety of manners resembling noticeably in his life and doctrines the chinese sage confucius and yet this man a pattern to the loftiest characters of his age strangled himself suicide was not deemed a crime by his followers among whom were some of the most faultless men of antiquity especially among the romans the doctrines of zeno were never popular and were confined to a small though influential party with the stoics ended among the greeks all inquiry of a philosophical nature worthy of a special mention until centuries later when philosophy was revived in the christian schools of alexandria where the hero element of faith was united with the greek ideal of reason the struggles of so many great thinkers from thales to aristotle all ended in doubt and in despair it was discovered that all of them were wrong or rather partial and their error was without a remedy until the fullness of time should reveal more clearly the plan of the great temple of truth in which they were laying foundation stones the bright and glorious period of greek philosophy was from socrates to aristotle philosophical inquiries began about the origin of things and ended with an elaborate systematization of the forms of thought which was the most magnificent triumph that the unaided intellect of man ever achieved socrates does not found a school nor elaborate a system he reveals most precious truths and stimulates the youth who listen to his instructions by the doctrine that it is the duty of man to pursue a knowledge of himself 
which is to be sought in that divine reason which dwells within him and which also rules the world he believes in science he loves truth for its own sake he loves virtue which consists in the knowledge of the good plato seizes the weapons of his great master and is imbued with his spirit he is full of hope for science and humanity with soaring boldness he directs his inquiries to futurity dissatisfied with the present and cherishing a fond hope of a better existence he speculates on god and the soul he is not much interested in physical phenomena he does not like thales strive to find out the beginning of all things but the highest good by which his immortal soul may be refreshed and prepared for the future life in which he firmly believes the sensible is an impenetrable empire but ideas are certitudes and upon these he dwells with rapt and mystical enthusiasm a great poetical rhapsodist severe dialectician as he is believing in truth and beauty and goodness then aristotle following out the method of his teachers attempts to exhaust experience and directs his inquiries into the outward world of sense and observation but all with the view of discovering from phenomena the unconditional truth in which he too believes but everything in this world is fleeting and transitory and therefore it is not easy to arrive at truth a cold doubt creeps into the experimental mind of aristotle with all his learning and his logic the epicureans arise misreading or corrupting the purer teaching of their founder they place their hopes in sensual enjoyment they despair of truth but the world will not be abandoned to despair the stoics rebuke the impiety which is blended with sensualism and place their hopes on virtue yet it is unattainable virtue while their god is not a moral governor but subject to necessity thus did those old giants grope about for they did not know the god who was revealed unto the more spiritual sense of abraham moses david and isaiah and yet with all their errors they were the greatest benefactors of the ancient world they gave dignity to intellectual inquiries while by their lives they set examples of a pure morality the romans added absolutely nothing to the philosophy of the greeks nor were they much interested in any speculative inquiries it was only the ethical views of the old sages which had attraction or force to them they were too material to love pure subjective inquiries they had conquered the land they disdained the empire of the air there were doubtless students of the greek philosophy among the romans perhaps as early as cato the censor but there were only two persons of note in rome who wrote philosophy till the time of cicero Arephanius and rubinius and these were epicureans cicero was the first to systematize the philosophy which contributed so greatly to his intellectual culture but even he added nothing he was only a commentator and expositor nor did he seek to found a system or a school but merely to influence and instruct men of his own rank those subjects which had the greatest attraction for the grecian schools cicero regarded as beyond the power of human cognition and therefore looked upon the practical as the proper domain of human inquiry yet he held logic in great esteem as furnishing rules for methodical investigation he adopted the doctrine of socrates as to the pursuit of moral good and regarded the duties which grow out of the relations of human society as preferable to those of pursuing scientific researches he had a great contempt for knowledge which could lead neither to the clear apprehension of certitude nor to practical applications he thought it impossible to arrive at a knowledge of god or the nature of the soul or the origin of the world and thus he was led to look upon the sensible and the present as of more importance than inconclusive inductions or deductions from a truth not satisfactorily established cicero was an eclectic seizing on what was true and clear in the ancient systems and disregarding what was simply a matter of speculation this is especially seen in his treatise de finibus bonorum et malorum in which the opinions of all the grecian schools concerning the supreme good are expounded and compared nor does he hesitate to declare that the highest happiness consists in the knowledge of nature and science which is the true source of pleasure both to gods and men yet these are but hopes in which it does not become us to indulge it is the actual the real the practical which preeminently claims attention in other words the knowledge which will furnish man with a guide and rule of life even in the consideration of moral questions cicero is pursued by the conflict of opinions although in this department he is most at home the points he is most anxious to establish are the doctrines of god and the soul these are most fully treated in his essay de natura deorum in which he submits the doctrines of the epicureans and the stoics to the objections of the academy 
he admits that man is unable to form true conceptions of god but acknowledges the necessity of assuming one supreme god as the creator and ruler of all things moving all things remote from all mortal mixture and endued with eternal motion in himself he seems to believe in a divine providence ordering good to man in the soul's immortality in free will in the dignity of human nature in the dominion of reason in the restraint of the passions as necessary to virtue in a life of public utility in an immutable morality in the imitation of the divine thus there is little of original thought in the moral theories of cicero which are the result of observation rather than of any philosophical principle we might enumerate his various opinions and show what an enlightened mind he possessed but this would not be the development of philosophy his views, interesting as they are, and generally wise and lofty, do not indicate any progress of the science. He merely repeats earlier doctrines. These were not without their utility, since they had great influence on the Latin fathers of the Christian Church. He was esteemed for his general enlightenment. He softened down the extreme views of the great thinkers before his day, and clearly unfolded what had become obscured. He was a critic of philosophy, an expositor whom we can scarcely spare. If anybody advanced philosophy among the Romans, it was Epictetus, and even he only in the realm of ethics. Quintius Sextius, in the time of Augustus, had revived the Pythagorean doctrines. Seneca had recommended the severe morality of the Stoics, but added nothing that was not previously known. The greatest light among the Romans was the Phrygian slave Epictetus, who was born about fifty years after the birth of Jesus Christ, and taught in the time of the Emperor Domitian. Though he did not leave any written treatises, his doctrines were preserved and handed down by his disciple, Arian, who had for him the reverence that Plato had for Socrates. The loftiness of his recorded views has made some to think that he must have been indebted to Christianity, for no one before him revealed precepts so much in accordance with its spirit. He was a Stoic, but he held in highest estimation Socrates and Plato. It is not for the solution of metaphysical questions that he was remarkable. He was not a dialectician, but a moralist, and as such takes the highest ground of all the old inquirers after truth. With him, as to Cicero and Seneca, philosophy is the wisdom of life. He sets no value on logic, nor much on physics, but he reveals sentiments of great simplicity and grandeur. His great idea is the purification of the soul. He believes in the severest self-denial, he would guard against the siren spells of pleasure, he would make men feel that in order to be good they must first feel that they are evil. He condemns suicide, although it had been defended by the Stoics. He would complain of no one, not even as to injustice. He would not injure his enemies. He would pardon all offenses. He would feel universal compassion, since men sin from ignorance. He would not easily blame, since we have none to condemn but ourselves. He would not strive after honor or office, since we put ourselves in subjection to that we seek or prize. He would constantly bear in mind that all things are transitory, and that they are not our own. He would bear evils with patience, even as he would practice self-denial of pleasure. He would, in short, be calm, free, keep in subjection his passions, avoid self-indulgence, and practice a broad charity and benevolence. He felt that he owed all to God, that all was his gift, and that we should thus live in accordance with his will, that we should be grateful not only for our bodies, but for our souls and reason, by which we attain to greatness. And if God has given us such a priceless gift, we should be contented, and not even seek to alter our external relations, which are doubtless for the best. We should wish, indeed, for only what God wills and sends, and we should avoid pride and haughtiness as well as discontent, and seek to fulfill our allotted part. Such were the moral precepts of Epictetus, in which we see the nearest approach to Christianity that had been made in the ancient world, although there is no proof or probability that he knew anything of Christ or the Christians. And these sublime truths had a great influence, especially on the mind of the most lofty and pure of all the Roman emperors, Marcus Aurelius, who lived the principles he had learned from the slave, and whose thoughts are still held in admiration. Thus did the philosophic speculation about the beginning of things lead to elaborate systems of thought, and end in practical rules of life, until in spirit they had, with Epictetus, harmonized with many of the revealed truths which Christ and his apostles laid down for the regeneration of the world. Who cannot see in the inquiries of the old philosopher, whether into nature, or the operations of the mind, or the existence of God, or the immortality of the soul, or the way to happiness and virtue, a magnificent triumph of human genius, such as has been exhibited in no other department of human science? 
nay who does not rejoice to see in this slow but ever advancing development of man's comprehension of the truth the inspiration of that divine teacher that holy spirit which shall at last lead man into all truth we regret that our limits preclude a more extended view of the various systems which the old sages propounded systems full of errors yet also marked by important gains but whether false or true showing a marvelous reach of the human understanding modern researches have discarded many opinions that were highly valued in their day yet philosophy in its methods of reasoning is scarcely advanced since the time of aristotle while the subjects which agitated the grecian schools have been from time to time revived and rediscussed and are still unsettled if any intellectual pursuit has gone round in perpetual circles incapable apparently of progression or rest it is that glorious study of philosophy which has tasked more than any other the mightiest intellects of this world and which progressive or not will never be relinquished without the loss of what is most valuable in human culture authorities for original authorities in reference to the matter of this chapter read diogenes Laertes's Live of the Philosophers, the writings of Plato and Aristotle, Cicero, De Naturum Deorum, De Oratore, De Officius, De Divinatione, De Finibus, Tusculanae Disputationes, Xenophon Memorabilia, Bothius, De Consolation Philosophiae, Lucretius. The great modern authorities are the Germans, and these are very numerous. Among the most famous writers on the history of philosophy are Brucker, Hegel, Brandis, I. G. Buell, Tenemann, Hitter, Plessing, Schwegler, Hermann, Miners, Stahlbaum, and Spiegel. The history of Ritter is well translated and is always learned and suggestive. Tenemann, translated by Morel, is a good manual, brief but clear. In connection with the writings of the Germans, the great work of the French cousin should be consulted. The English historians of ancient philosophy are not so numerous as the Germans. The work of Enfield is based on Brucker, or is rather an abridgment. Archer Butler's lectures are suggestive and able, but discursive and vague. Grota has written learnedly on Socrates and other great lights. Lewis's biographical history of philosophy has the merit of clearness, and it is very interesting, but rather superficial. See also Thomas Stanley's History of Philosophy and the articles in Smith's Dictionary on the Leading Ancient Philosophers. J. W. Donaldson's continuation of K. O. Mueller's History of the Literature of Ancient Greece is learned and should be consulted with Thompson's notes on Archer Butler. Schleiermacher on Socrates, translated by Bishop Thurwall, is well worth attention. There are also fine articles in the Encyclopedias Britannica and Metropolitana. End of section 11. Section 12 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations. Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations, by John Lord. Socrates, Part 1. 470 to 399 BC. Greek Philosophy. To Socrates, the world owes a new method in philosophy and a great example in morals, and it would be difficult to settle whether his influence has been greater as a sage or a moralist. In either light, he is one of the august names of history. He has been venerated for more than two thousand years as a teacher of wisdom and as a martyr for the truths he taught. He did not commit his precious thoughts to writing. That work was done by his disciples, even as his exalted worth has been published by them, especially by Plato and Xenophon and if the greek philosophy did not culminate in him yet he laid down those principles by which only it could be advanced as a system maker both plato and aristotle were greater than he yet for original genius he was probably their superior and in important respects he was their master as a good man battling with infirmities and temptations and coming off triumphantly the ancient world has furnished no prouder example he was born about 470 or 469 years B.C., and therefore may be said to belong to that brilliant age of Grecian literature and art when Prodicus was teaching rhetoric, and Democritus was speculating about the doctrine of atoms, and Phidias was ornamenting temples, and Alcibiades was giving banquets, and Aristophanes was writing comedies, and Euripides was composing tragedies, and Aspasia was setting fashions, and Simon was fighting battles, and Pericles was making Athens the center of Grecian civilization. 
but he died thirty years after Pericles, so that what is most interesting in his great career took place during and after the Peloponnesian War, an age still interesting but not so brilliant as the one which immediately preceded it. It was the age of the sophists, those popular but superficial teachers who claimed to be the most advanced of their generation, men who were doubtless accomplished, but were cynical, skeptical, and utilitarian, placing a high estimate on popular favor and outside life, but very little on pure subjective truth or the wants of the soul. They were paid teachers and sought pupils from the sons of the rich, the more eminent of them being Protagoras, Gorgias, Hippias, and Prodicus men who traveled from city to city exciting great admiration for their rhetorical skill and really improving the public speaking of popular orators they also taught science to a limited extent and it was through them that athenian youth mainly acquired what little knowledge they had of arithmetic and geometry in loftiness of character they were not equal to those ionian philosophers who prior to socrates in the fifth century b c speculated on the great problems of the material universe the origin of the world, the nature of matter, and the source of power, and who, if they did not make discoveries, yet evinced great intellectual force. It was in this skeptical and irreligious age, when all classes were devoted to pleasure and money-making, but when there was great cultivation, especially in arts, that Socrates arose, whose appearance, says Grote, was a moral phenomenon. He was the son of a poor sculptor, and his mother was a midwife. His family was unimportant, although it belonged to an ancient Attic Gens. Socrates was rescued from his father's workshop by a wealthy citizen who perceived his genius, and who educated him at his own expense. He was twenty when he conversed with Parmenides and Zeno. He was twenty-eight when Phidias adorned the Parthenon. He was forty when he fought at Potidaea and rescued Alcibiades. At this period he was most distinguished for his physical strength and endurance a brave and patriotic soldier, insensible to heat and cold, and, though temperate in his habits, capable of drinking more wine without becoming intoxicated than anybody in Athens. His powerful physique and sensual nature inclined him to self-indulgence, but he early learned to restrain both appetites and passions. His physiognomy was ugly and his person repulsive. He was awkward, obese, and ungainly. His nose was flat, his lips were thick, and his neck large. He rolled his eyes, went barefooted, and wore a dirty old cloak. He spent his time chiefly in the market-place, talking with everybody, old or young, rich or poor, soldiers, politicians, artisans, or students, visiting even Aspasia, the cultivated wealthy courtesan, with whom he formed a friendship, so that, although he was very poor, his whole property being only five minae, about fifty dollars a year, it would seem he lived in good society. The ancient pagans were not so exclusive and aristocratic as the Christians of our day, who are ambitious of social position. Socrates never seemed to think about his social position at all, and uniformly acted as if he were well known and prominent. He was listened to because he was eloquent. His conversion is said to have been charming, and even fascinating. He was an original and ingenious man, different from everybody else, and was therefore what we call a character. But there was nothing austere or gloomy about him. Though lofty in his inquiries and serious in his mind, he resembled neither a Jewish prophet nor a medieval sage in his appearance. He looked rather like a Salinas, very witty, cheerful, good-natured, jocose, and disposed to make people laugh. He enjoined no austerities or penances. He was very attractive to the young and tolerant of human infirmities, even when he gave the best advice. He was the most human of teachers. Alcibiades was completely fascinated by his talk and made good resolutions. His great peculiarity in conversation was to ask questions, sometimes to gain information, but oftener to puzzle and raise a laugh. He sought to expose ignorance when it was pretentious. He made all the quacks and shams appear ridiculous. His irony was tremendous. Nobody could stand before his searching and unexpected questions, and he made nearly everyone with whom he conversed appear either as a fool or an ignoramus. He asked his questions with great apparent modesty, and thus drew a mesh over his opponents from which they could not extricate themselves. His process was the reductio ad absurdum. Hence he drew upon himself the wrath of the sophists. He had no intellectual arrogance, since he professed to know nothing himself, although he was conscious of his own intellectual superiority. He was contented to show that others knew no more than he. 
he had no passion for admiration no political ambition no desire for social distinction and he associated with men not for what they could do for him but for what he could do for them although poor he charged nothing for his teachings he seemed to despise riches since riches could only adorn or pamper the body he did not live in a cell or a cave or a tub but among the people as an apostle he must have accepted gifts since his means of living were exceedingly small even for athens he was very practical even while he lived above the world absorbed in lofty contemplations he was always talking with such as the skin dressers and leather dealers using homely language for his illustrations and uttering plain truths yet he was equally at home with poets and philosophers and statesmen he did not take much interest in that knowledge which was applied merely to rising in the world though plain practical and even homely in his conversation he was not utilitarian science had no charm to him since it was directed to utilitarian ends and was uncertain his sayings had such a lofty hidden wisdom that very few people understood him his utterances seemed either paradoxical or unintelligible or sophistical to the mentally proud and mentally feeble he was equally a bore most people probably thought him a nuisance since he was always about with his questions puzzling some confusing others and reproving all careless of love or hatred and contemptuous of all conventionalities so severely dialectical was he that he seemed to be a hair-splitter the very sophists whose ignorance and pretension he exposed looked upon him as a quibbler although there were some so severely trained was the grecian mind who saw the drift of his questions and admired his skill probably there are few educated people in these times who could have understood him any more easily than a modern audience even of scholars could take in one of the orations of demosthenes although they might laugh at the jokes of the sage and be impressed with the invectives of the orator and yet there were defects in socrates he was most provokingly sarcastic he turned everything to ridicule he remorselessly punctured every gas bag he met he heaped contempt on every snob he threw stones at every glass house and everybody lived in one he was not quite just to the sophists for they did not pretend to teach the higher life but chiefly rhetoric which is useful in its way and if they loved applause and riches and attached themselves to those whom they could utilize they were not different from the most fashionable teachers in any age and then socrates was not very delicate in his tastes he was too much carried away by the fascinations of aspasia when he knew she was not virtuous although it was doubtless her remarkable intellect which most attracted him not her physical beauty since in the menexus by many ascribed to plato he is made to recite at length one of her long orations and in the symposium he is made to appear absolutely indelicate in his conduct with alcibiades and to make what would be abhorrent to us a matter of irony although there was the severest control of the passions to me it has always seemed a strange thing that such an ugly satirical provoking man could have won and retained the love of xanthippe especially since he was so careless of his dress and did so little to provide for the wants of the household i do not wonder that she scolded him or became very violent in her temper since in her worst tirades he only provokingly laughed at her a modern christian of society would have left him but perhaps in pagan athens she could not have got a divorce it is only in these enlightened and progressive times that women desert their husbands when they are tantalizing or when they do not properly support the family or spend their times at the clubs or in society into which it would seem that socrates was received even the best barefooted and dirty as he was and for his intellectual gifts alone think of such a man being the oracle of a modern salon either in paris london or new york with his repulsive appearance and tantalizing and provoking irony but in artistic athens at one time he was all the fashion everybody liked to hear him talk everybody was both amused and instructed he provoked no envy since he affected modesty and ignorance apparently asking his questions for information and was so meanly clad and lived in such a poor way though he provoked animosities he had many friends if his language was sarcastic his affections were kind he was always surrounded by the most gifted men of his time the wealthy crito constantly attended him plato and xenophon were enthusiastic pupils even alcibiades was charmed by his conversation apollodorus and antisthenes rarely quitted his side cebus and simonides came from thebes to hear him asocrates and aristippus followed in his train euclid of megara sought his society at the risk of his life the tyrant critias and even the sophist protagoras acknowledged his marvellous power but i cannot linger longer on the man with his gifts and peculiarities more important things demand our attention 
I propose briefly to show his contributions to philosophy and ethics. In regard to the first, I will not dwell on his method, which is both subtle and dialectical. We are not Greeks. Yet it was his method which revolutionized philosophy. That was original. He saw this, that the theories of his day were mere opinions, even the lofty speculations of the Ionian philosophers were dreams, and the teachings of the sophists were mere words. He despised both dreams and words. Speculations ended in the indefinite and insoluble, words ended in rhetoric. Neither dreams nor words revealed the true, the beautiful, and the good, which to his mind were the only realities, the only sure foundation for a philosophical system. So he propounded certain questions, which, when answered, produced glaring contradictions, from which disputants shrank. Their conclusions broke down their assumptions. They stood convicted of ignorance, to which all his artful and subtle questions tended, and which it was his aim to prove. He showed that they did not know what they affirmed. He proved that their definitions were wrong or incomplete, since they logically led to contradictions, and he showed that for purposes of disputation, the same meaning must always attach to the same word, since in ordinary language terms have different meanings, partly true and partly false, which produce confusion in argument. He would be precise and definite, and use the utmost rigor of language, without which inquirers and disputants would not understand each other. Every definition should include the whole thing and nothing else, otherwise people would not know what they were talking about and would be forced into absurdities. Thus arose the celebrated definitions, the first step in Greek philosophy, intending to show what is and what is not. After demonstrating what is not, Socrates advanced to the demonstration of what is and thus laid a foundation for certain knowledge. Thus he arrived at clear conceptions of justice, friendship, patriotism, courage, and other certitudes on which truth is based. He wanted only positive truth, something to build upon, like Bacon and all great inquirers. Having reached the certain, he would apply it to all the relations of life and to all kinds of knowledge. Unless knowledge is certain, it is worthless. There is no foundation to build upon. Uncertain or indefinite knowledge is no knowledge at all. It may be very pretty, or assuming, or ingenious, but no more valuable for philosophical research than poetry or dreams or speculations. How far the definitions of Socrates led to the solution of the great problems of philosophy in the hands of such dialecticians as Plato and Aristotle, I will not attempt to enter upon here. But this I think I am warranted in saying, that the main object and aim of Socrates, as a teacher of philosophy, were to establish certain elemental truths concerning which there could be no dispute, and then to reason from them, since they were not mere assumptions but certitudes, and certitudes also which appealed to human consciousness, and therefore could not be overthrown. If I were teaching metaphysics, it would be necessary for me to make clear this method. The questions and definitions by which Socrates is thought to have laid the foundation of true knowledge, and therefore of all healthful advance in philosophy. But for my present purpose, I do not care so much what his method was as what his aim was. The aim of Socrates, then, being to find out and teach what is definite and certain, as a foundation of knowledge, having cleared away the rubbish of ignorance, he attached very little importance to what is called physical science. And no wonder, since science in his day was very imperfect. There were not enough facts known on which to base sound inductions, better deductions from established principles. What is deemed most certain in this age was the most uncertain of all knowledge in his day. Scientific knowledge, truly speaking, there was none. It was all speculation. Democritus might resolve the material universe, the earth, the sun, and the stars, into combinations produced by the motion of atoms. But whence the original atoms, and what force gave to them motion? The proudest philosopher, speculating on the origin of the universe, is convicted of ignorance. Much has been said in praise of the Ionian philosophers, and justly, so far as their genius and loftiness of character are considered. But what did they discover? What truths did they arrive at to serve as foundation stones of science? They were among the greatest intellects of antiquity, but their method was a wrong one. Their philosophy was based on assumptions and speculations, and therefore was worthless, since they settled nothing. Their science was based on inductions which were not reliable because of a lack of facts. They drew conclusions as to the origin of the universe from material phenomena. Thales, seeing that plants are sustained by dew and rain, concluded that water was the first beginning of things. Anaximenes, seeing that animals die without air, thought that air was the great primal cause. Then Diogenes of Crete, making a fanciful speculation, imparted to air an intellectual energy. Heraclitus of Ephesus substituted fire for air. None of the illustrious Ionians reached anything higher than that the first cause of all things must be intelligent. 
the speculations of succeeding philosophers living in a more material age all pertained to the world of matter which they could see with their eyes and in close connection with speculations about matter the cause of which they could not settle was indifference to the spiritual nature of man which they could not see and all the wants of the soul and the existence of the future state where the soul alone was of any account so atheism and the disbelief of the existence of the soul after death characterized that materialism without god and without a future there was no stimulus to virtue and no foundation for anything they said let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die the essence and spirit of all paganism socrates seeing how unsatisfactory were all physical inquiries and what evils materialism introduced into society making the body everything and the soul nothing turned his attention to the world within for physics substituted morals he knew the uncertainty of physical speculation but believed in the certainty of moral truths he knew that there was a reality in justice in friendship in courage like job he reposed on consciousness he turned his attention to what afterwards gave immortality to descartes to the skepticism of the sophists he opposed self-evident truths he proclaimed the sovereignty of virtue the universality of moral obligation moral certitude was the platform from which he would survey the universe it was the ladder by which he would ascend to the loftiest regions of knowledge and of happiness though he was negative in his means he was positive in his ends he was the first who had glimpses of the true mission of philosophy even to sit in judgment on all knowledge whether it pertains to art or politics or science eliminating the false and retaining the true it was his mission to separate truth from error he taught the world how to weigh evidence he would discard any doctrine which logically carried out led to absurdity instead of turning his attention to outward phenomena he dwelt on the truths which either god or consciousness reveals instead of the creation he dwelt on the creator it was not the body he cared for so much as the soul not wealth not power not the appetites were the true source of pleasure but the peace and harmony of the soul the inquiry should be not what we shall eat but how we shall resist temptation how shall we keep the soul pure how shall we arrive at virtue how shall we best serve our country how shall we best educate our children how shall we expel worldliness and deceit and lies how shall we walk with god for there is a god and there is immortality and eternal justice these are the great certitudes of human life and it is only by these that the soul will expand and be happy forever end of section 12 Section 13 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations. Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations by John Lord. Socrates, Part 2. Thus there was a close connection between his philosophy and his ethics. But it was as a moral teacher that he won his most enduring fame. The teacher of wisdom became subordinate to the man who lived it. As a living Christian is nobler than merely an acute theologian, so he who practices virtue is greater than the one who preaches it. The dissection of the passions is not so difficult as the regulation of the passions. The moral force of the soul is superior to the utmost grasp of the intellect. The thoughts of Pascal are all the more read because the religious life of Pascal is known to have been lofty augustine was the oracle of the middle ages from the radiance of his character as much as from the brilliancy and originality of his intellect bernard swayed society more by his sanctity than by his learning the useful life of socrates was devoted not merely to establish the grounds of moral obligation in opposition to the false and worldly teaching of his day but to the practice of temperance disinterestedness and patriotism he found that the ideas of his contemporaries centered in the pleasure of the body he would make his body subservient to the welfare of the soul no writer of antiquity says so much of the soul as plato his chosen disciple and no other one placed so much value on pure subjective knowledge his longings after love were scarcely exceeded by augustine or saint teresa not for a divine spouse but for the harmony of the soul with longings after love were united longings after immortality when the mind would revel forever in the contemplation of eternal ideas and the solution of mysteries a sort of dante in heaven virtue became the foundation of happiness and almost a synonym for knowledge he discoursed on knowledge in its connection with virtue after this fashion of solomon in his proverbs happiness virtue knowledge this was the socratic trinity 
the three indissolubly connected together forming the life of the soul the only precious thing a man has since it is immortal and therefore to be guarded beyond all bodily and mundane interests but human nature is frail the soul is fettered and bewildered hence the need of some outside influence some illumination to guard or to restrain or to guide this inspiration he was persuaded was imparted to him from time to time as he had need by the monitions of an internal voice which he called greek daemonion or daemon not a personification like an angel or devil but a divine sign or supernatural voice from youth he was accustomed to obey this prohibitory voice and to speak of it a voice which forbade him to enter on public life or to take any thought for a prepared defense on his trial the fathers of the church regarded this daemon as a devil probably from the name but it is not far in its real meaning from the divine grace of st augustine and of all men famed for christian experience that restraining grace which keeps good men from folly or sin Socrates again divorced happiness from pleasure identical things with most pagans happiness is the peace and harmony of the soul pleasure comes from animal sensations or the gratification of worldly and ambitious desires and therefore is often demoralizing happiness is an elevated joy a beatitude existing with pain and disease whenever the soul is triumphant over the body while pleasure is transient and comes from what is perishable hence but little account should be made of pain and suffering or even of death the life is more than meat and virtue is its own reward there is no reward of virtue in mere outward and worldly prosperity and with virtue there is no evil in adversity one must do right because it is right not because it is expedient he must do right whatever advantages may appear by not doing it a good citizen must obey the laws because they are laws he may not violate them because temporal and immediate advantages are promised a wise man and therefore a good man will be temperate he must neither eat nor drink to excess but temperance is not abstinence socrates not only enjoined temperance as a great virtue but he practiced it he was a model of sobriety and yet he drank wine at feasts at those glorious symposia where he discoursed with his friends on the highest themes while he controlled both appetites and passions in order to promote true happiness that is the welfare of the soul he was not solicitous as others were for outward prosperity which could not extend beyond mortal life he did not lacerate the body like brahmins and monks to make the soul independent of it he was a greek and a practical man anything but visionary and regarded the body as a sacred temple of the soul to be kept beautiful for beauty is as much an eternal idea as friendship or love hence he threw no contempt on art since art is based on beauty he approved of athletic exercises which strengthened and beautified the body but he would not defile the body or weaken it either by lusts or austerities passions were not to be exterminated but controlled and controlled by reason the light within us that which guides to true knowledge and hence to virtue and hence to happiness the law of temperance therefore is self-control courage was another of his certitudes that which animated the soldier on the battlefield with patriotic glow and lofty self-sacrifice life is subordinate to patriotism it was of but little consequence whether a man died or not in the discharge of duty to do right was the main thing because it was right like George Fox, he would do right if the world were blotted out. The weak point, to my mind, in the Socratic philosophy, considered in its ethical bearings, was the confounding of virtue with knowledge and making them identical. Socrates could probably have explained this difficulty away, for no one more than he appreciated the tyranny of passion and appetite, which thus fettered the will, according to St. Paul, the evil that I would not, that I do men often commit sin when the consequences of it and the nature of it press upon the mind the knowledge of good and evil does not always restrain a man from doing what he knows will end in grief and shame the restraint comes not from knowledge but from divine aid which was probably what socrates meant by his daemon a warning and a constraining power est deus in nobis agitante calissimus illo but this is not exactly the knowledge which Socrates meant, or Solomon. 
alcibiades was taught to see the loveliness of virtue and to admire it but he had not the divine and restraining power which socrates called an inspiration and others would call grace yet socrates himself with passions and appetites as great as alcibiades restrained them was assisted to do so by that divine power which he recognized and probably adored how far he felt his personal responsibility to this power i do not know the sense of personal responsibility to god is one of the highest manifestations of christian life and implies a recognition of god as a personality as a moral governor whose eye is everywhere and whose commands are absolute many have a vague idea of providence as pervading and ruling the universe without a sense of personal responsibility to him in other words without a fear of him such as moses taught and which is represented by david as the beginning of wisdom the fear to do wrong not only because it is wrong but also because it is displeasing to him who can both punish and reward i do not believe that socrates had this idea of god but i do believe that he recognized his existence and providence most people in greece and rome had religious instincts and believed in supernatural forces who exercised an influence over their destiny although they called them gods or divinities and not the god almighty whom moses taught the existence of temples the offices of priests and the consultation of oracles and soothsayers all point to this and the people not only believed in the existence of these supernatural powers to whom they erected temples and statues but many of them believed in a future state of rewards and punishments otherwise the names of minos and ramadanthus and other judges of the dead are unintelligible paganism and mythology did not deny the existence and power of gods yea the immortal gods they only multiplied their number representing them as avenging deities with human passions and frailties and offering to them gross and superstitious rites of worship they had imperfect and even degrading ideas of the gods but acknowledged their existence and their power socrates emancipated himself from these degrading superstitions and had a loftier idea of god than the people or he would not have been accused of impiety that is a descent from the popular belief although there is one thing which i cannot understand in his life and cannot harmonize with his general teachings that in his last hours his last act was to command the sacrifice of a cock to Asclepius. but whatever may have been his precise and definite ideas of god and immortality it is clear that he soared beyond his contemporaries in his conceptions of providence and of duty he was a reformer and a missionary preaching a higher morality and revealing loftier truths than any other person that we know of in pagan antiquity although there lived in india about two hundred years before his day a sage whom they called buddha whom some modern scholars think approached nearer to christ than did socrates or marcus aurelius very possibly have we any reason to adduce that god has ever been without his witnesses on earth or ever will be why could he not have imparted wisdom both to buddha and socrates as he did to abraham moses and paul i look upon socrates as one of the witnesses and agents of the almighty power on this earth to proclaim exalted truth and turn people from wickedness he himself not indistinctly claimed this mission think what a man he was truly he was a moral phenomenon you see a man of strong animal propensities but with a lofty soul appearing in a wicked and materialistic and possibly atheistic age overturning all previous systems of philosophy and inculcating a new and higher law of morals you see him spending his whole life and a long life in disinterested teachings and labors teaching without pay attaching himself to youth working in poverty and discomfort indifferent to wealth and honor and even power inculcating incessantly the worth and dignity of the soul and its amazing and incalculable superiority to all the pleasures of the body and all the rewards of a worldly life who gave to him this wisdom and this almost superhuman virtue who gave to him this insight into the fundamental principles of morality who in this respect made him a greater light and a clearer expounder than the christian paley who made him in all spiritual discernment a wiser man than the gifted john stuart mill who seems to have been a candid searcher after truth in the wisdom of socrates you see some higher force than intellectual hardihood or intellectual clearness how much this pagan did to emancipate and elevate the soul how much he did to present the vanities and pursuits of worldly men in their true light 
what a rebuke were his life and doctrines to the epicureanism which was pervading all classes of society and preparing the way for ruin who cannot see in him a forerunner of that great teacher who was the friend of publicans and sinners who rejected the leaven of the pharisees and the speculations of the sadducees who scorned the riches and glories of the world who rebuked everything pretentious and arrogant who joined humility and self-abnegation who exposed the ignorance and sophistries of ordinary teachers and who propounded to his disciples no such miserable interrogatory as who shall show us any good but a higher question for their solution and that of all pleasure-seeking and money-hunting people to the end of time what shall a man give in exchange for his soul it very rarely happens that a great benefactor escapes persecution especially if he is persistent in denouncing false opinions which are popular or prevailing follies and sins as the scribes and pharisees who had been so severely and openly exposed in all their hypocrisies by our lord took the lead in causing his crucifixion so the sophists and tyrants of athens headed the fanatical persecution of socrates because he exposed their shallowness and worldliness and stung them to the quick by his sarcasms and ridicule his elevated morality and lofty spiritual life do not alone account for the persecution if he had let persons alone and had not ridiculed their opinions and pretensions they probably would have left him alone Galileo aroused the wrath of the Inquisition, not for his scientific discoveries, but because he ridiculed the Dominican and Jesuit guardians of the philosophy of the Middle Ages, and because he seemed to undermine the authority of the scriptures and of the church. His boldness, his sarcasms, and his mocking spirit were more offensive than his doctrines. The church did not persecute Kepler or Pascal. The Athenians may have condemned Xenophanes and Anaxagoras, yet not the other Ionian philosophers, nor the lofty speculations of Plato, but they murdered Socrates because they hated him. It was not pleasant to the gay leaders of Athenian society to hear the utter vanity of their worldly lives painted with such unsparing severity, nor was it pleasant to the sophists and rhetoricians to see their idols overthrown and they themselves exposed as false teachers and shadow pretenders. No one likes to see himself held up to scorn and mockery. Nobody is willing to be shown up as ignorant and conceited. The people of Athens did not like to see their gods ridiculed, for the logical sequence of the teachings of Socrates was to undermine the popular religion. It was very offensive to rich and worldly people to be told that their riches and pleasures were transient and worthless. It was impossible that those rhetoricians who gloried in words, those sophists who covered up the truth, those pedants who prided themselves on their technicalities, those politicians who lived by corruption, those worldly fathers who thought only of pushing the fortunes of their children, should not see in Socrates their uncompromising foe. And when he added mockery and ridicule to contempt, and piqued their vanity, and offended their pride, they bitterly hated him and wished him out of the way. My wonder is that he should have been tolerated until he was seventy years of age. Men less offensive than he have been burned alive and stoned to death and tortured on the rack and devoured by lions in the amphitheater. It is the fate of prophets to be exiled or slandered or jeered at or stigmatized or banished from society, to be subjected to some sort of persecution. But when prophets denounce woes and utter invectives and provoke by stinging sarcasms, they have generally been killed. No matter how enlightened society is or how tolerant the age, he who utters offensive truths will be disliked and in some ways punished. So Socrates must meet the fate of all benefactors who make themselves disliked and hated. First, the great comic poet Aristophanes, in his comedy called The Clouds, held him up to ridicule and reproach, and thus prepared the way for his arraignment and trial. He is made to utter a thousand impieties and impertinences. He is made to talk like a man of the greatest vanity and conceit, and to throw contempt and scorn on everybody else. It is not probable that the poet entered into any formal conspiracy against him, but found him a good subject of raillery and mockery, since Socrates was then very unpopular, aside from his moral teachings, for being declared by the oracle of Delphi the wisest man in the world, and for having been intimate with the two men whom the Athenians above all men justly execrated. Critias, the chief of the thirty tyrants whom Lysander had imposed, 
or at least consented to after the Peloponnesian War, and Alcibiades, whose evil counsels had led to an unfortunate expedition, and who in addition had proved himself a traitor to his country. Public opinion being now against him, on various grounds he is brought to trial before the dicastery, a board of some five hundred judges, leading citizens of Athens. One of his chief accusers was Anatus, a rich tradesman, a very narrow mind, personally hostile to Socrates because of the influence the philosopher had exerted over his son, yet who then had considerable influence from the active part he had taken in the expulsion of the thirty tyrants. The more formidable accuser was Miletus, a poet and a rhetorician, who had been irritated by Socrates's terrible cross-examination. The principal charges against him were that he did not admit the gods acknowledged by the Republic, and that he corrupted the youth of Athens. In regard to the first charge, it could not be technically proved that he had assailed the gods, for he was exact in his legal worship, but really and virtually there was some foundation for the accusation, since Socrates was a religious innovator, if ever there was one. His lofty realism was subversive of popular superstitions when logically carried out. As to the second charge of corrupting youth, this was utterly groundless, for he had uniformly enjoined courage and temperance and obedience to the laws and patriotism and the control of the passions and all the higher sentiments of the soul. But the tendency of his teachings was to create in young men contempt for all institutions based on falsehood or superstition or tyranny, and he openly disapproved of some of the existing laws, such as choosing magistrates by lot, and freely expressed his opinions. In a narrow and technical sense, there was some reason for this charge, for if a young man came to combat his father's business or habits of life or general opinions in consequence of his own superior enlightenment, it might be made out that he had not sufficient respect for his father and thus was failing in the virtues of reverence and filial obedience. Considering the genius and innocence of the accused, he did not make an able defense. He might have done better. It appeared as if he did not wish to be acquitted. He took no thought of what he should say, he made no preparation for so great an occasion. He made no appeal to the passions and feelings of his judges. He refused the assistance of Lysias, the greatest orator of the day. He brought neither his wife nor children to incline the judges in his favor by their sighs and tears. His discourse was manly, bold, noble, dignified, but without passion and without art. His unpremeditated replies seemed to scorn an elaborate defense. He even seemed to rebuke his judges rather than to conciliate them. On the culprit's bench he assumed the manners of a teacher. He might easily have saved himself, for there was but a small majority, only five or six at the first vote, for his condemnation, and then he irritated his judges unnecessarily. According to the laws, he had the privilege of proposing a substitution for his punishment, which would have been accepted exile, for instance, but, with a provoking and yet amusing irony, he asked to be supported at the public expense in the Pyrtaneum, that is, he asked for the highest honor of the Republic, for a condemned criminal to ask this was audacity and defiance. We cannot otherwise suppose than that he did not wish to be acquitted. He wished to die. The time had come, he had fulfilled his mission, he was old and poor, his condemnation would bring his truths before the world in a more impressive form. He knew the moral greatness of a martyr's death. He reposed in the calm consciousness of having rendered great services, of having made important revelations. He never had an ignoble love of life. Death had no terrors to him at any time. So he was perfectly resigned to his fate. Most willingly he accepted the penalty of plain speaking and presented no serious remonstrances and no indignant denials. Had he pleaded eloquently for his life, he would not have fulfilled his mission. He acted with amazing foresight. He took the only course which would secure a lasting influence. He knew that his death would evoke a new spirit of inquiry, which would spread over the civilized world. It was a public disappointment that he did not defend himself with more earnestness. But he was not seeking applause for his genius, simply the final triumph of his cause, best secured by martyrdom. So he received a sentence with evident satisfaction, and in the interval between it and his execution he spent his time in cheerful but lofty conversations with his disciples. He unhesitatingly refused to escape from his prison when the means would have been provided. His last hours were of immortal beauty. His friends were dissolved in tears, but he was calm, composed, triumphant, and when he lay down to die he prayed that his migration to the unknown land might be propitious. 
He died without pain, as the hemlock produced only torpor. His death, as well may be supposed, created a profound impression. It was one of the most memorable events of the pagan world whose greatest light was extinguished. No, not extinguished, since it has been shining ever since in the memorabilia of Xenophon and the dialogues of Plato. Too late, the Athenians repented of their injustice and cruelty. They erected to his memory a brazen statue, executed by Lysippus. His character and his ideas are alike immortal. The schools of Athens properly date from his death, about the year 400 BC, and these schools resumed the shame of her loss of political power. The Socratic philosophy, as expounded by Plato, survived the wrecks of material greatness. It entered even into the Christian schools, especially at Alexandria. It has ever assisted and animated the earnest searchers after the certitudes of life. It has permeated the intellectual world and found admirers and expounders in all the universities of Europe and America. No man has ever been found, says Grote, strong enough to bend the bow of Socrates, the father of philosophy, the most original thinker of antiquity. His teachings gave an immense impulse to civilization, but they could not reform or save the world. It was too deeply sunk in the infamies and immoralities of an Epicurean life. Nor was his philosophy ever popular in any age of our world. It never will be popular until the light which men hate shall expel the darkness which they love. But it has been the comfort and the joy of an esoteric few, the witnesses of truth whom God chooses, to keep alive the virtues and the ideas which shall ultimately triumph over all the forces of evil. Authorities The direct sources are chiefly Plato, Joet's translation, and Xenophon. Indirect sources, chiefly Aristotle, Metaphysics, Diogenes, Laertius's Lives of Philosophers, Grote's History of Greece, Brandis's Plato, in Smith's Dictionary, Ralph Waldo Emerson's Representative Men, Cicero on Immortality, J. Martineau, Essay on Plato, Thurwall's History of Greece. See also the late work of Curtius, Ritter's History of Philosophy, F. D. Maurice's History of Moral Philosophy, G. H. Lewis's Biographical History of Philosophy, Hampton's Fathers of Greek Philosophy, J. S. Blackie's Wise Men of Greece, Star King's Lecture on Socrates, Smith's Biographical Dictionary, Uber Wegg's History of Philosophy, W. A. Butler's History of Ancient Philosophy, Grote's Aristotle. End of section 13. Section 14 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations. Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1, The Old Pagan Civilizations, by John Lord. Phidias, Part 1. 500 to 430 B.C. Greek Art. I suppose there is no subject at this time which interests cultivated people in favored circumstances more than art. They travel in Europe, they visit galleries, they survey cathedrals, they buy pictures, they collect old china, they learn to draw and paint, they go into ecstasies over statues and bronzes, they fill their houses with bric-a-brac, they assume a cynical criticism, or gossip pedantically, whether they know what they are talking about or not. In short, the contemplation of art is a fashion concerning which it is not well to be ignorant, and about which there is an amazing amount of cant pretension and borrowed opinions. Artists themselves differ in their judgments, and many who patronize them have no severity of discrimination. We see bad pictures on the walls of private palaces, as well as in public galleries, for which fabulous prices are paid because they are, or are supposed to be, the creation of great masters, or because they are rare like old books in an antiquarian library, or because fashion has given them a fictitious value even when these pictures fail to create pleasure or emotion in those who view them. And yet there is great enjoyment to some people in the contemplation of a beautiful building or statue or painting, as of a beautiful landscape or of a glorious sky. The ideas of beauty, of grace, of grandeur, which are eternal, are suggested to the mind and soul, and these cultivate and refine in proportion as the mind and soul are enlarged, especially among the rich, the learned, and the favored classes. So, in high civilizations, especially material, art is not only a fashion, but a great enjoyment, a lofty study, 
and a theme of general criticism and constant conversation it is my object of course to present the subject historically rather than critically my criticisms would be mere opinions worth no more than those of thousands of other people as a public teacher to those who may derive some instruction from my labors and studies i presume to offer only reflections on art as it existed among the greeks and to show its developments in an historical point of view the reader may be surprised that i should venture to present phidias as one of the benefactors of the world when so little is known about him or can be known about him so far as the man is concerned i might as well lecture on melchizedek or pharaoh or one of the dukes of edom there are no materials to construct a personal history which would be interesting, such as abound in reference to Michelangelo or Raphael. Thus he must be made the mere text of a great subject. The development of art is an important part of the history of civilization. The influence of art on human culture and happiness is prodigious. Ancient Grecian art marks one of the stepping stones of the race. Any man who largely contributed to its development was a world benefactor. Now, history says this much of Phidias, that he lived in the time of Pericles, in the culminating period of Grecian glory, and ornamented the Parthenon with his unrivaled statues, which Parthenon was to Athens what Solomon's temple was to Jerusalem, a wonder, a pride, and a glory. His great contribution to that matchless edifice was the statue of Minerva, made of gold and ivory, forty feet in height, the gold of which alone was worth forty-four talents about fifty thousand dollars an immense sum when gold was probably worth more than twenty times its present value all antiquity was unanimous in its praise of this statue and the exactness and finish of its details were as remarkable as the grandeur and majesty of its proportions another of the famous works of phidias was the bronze statue of minerva which was the glory of the acropolis this was sixty feet in height but even this yielded to the colossal statue of Zeus or Jupiter in his great temple at Olympia, representing the figure in a sitting posture, forty feet high, on a throne made of gold, ebony, ivory, and precious stones. In this statue, the immortal artist sought to represent power in repose, as Michelangelo did in his statue of Moses. So famous was this majestic statue that it was considered a calamity to die without seeing it and it served as a model for all subsequent representations of majesty and repose among the ancients this statue removed to constantinople by theodosius the great remained undestroyed until the year four hundred seventy five a d phidias also executed various other works all famous in his day which have however perished but many executed under his superintendence still remain and are universally admired for their grace and majesty of form the great master himself was probably vastly superior to any of his disciples and impressed his genius on the age having so far as we know no rival among his contemporaries as he has had no successor among the moderns of equal originality and power unless it be michelangelo his distinguished excellence was simplicity and grandeur and he was to sculpture what aeschylus was to tragic poetry sublime and grand representing ideal excellence Though his works have perished, the ideas he represented still live. His fame is immortal, though we know so little about him. It is based on the admiration of antiquity, on the universal praise which his creations extorted even from the severest critics in an age of art, when the best energies of an ingenious people were directed to it with the absorbing devotion now given to mechanical inventions and those pursuits which make men rich and comfortable. It would be interesting to know the private life of this great artist, his ardent loves and fierce resentments, his social habits, his public honors and triumphs, but this is mere speculation. We may presume that he was rich, flattered, and admired, the companion of great statesmen, rulers, and generals, not a persecuted man like Dante, but honored like Raphael, one of the fortunate of earth, since he was the master of what was most valued in his day. But it is the work which he represents, and still more comprehensively art itself in the ancient world, to which I would call your attention, especially the expression of art in buildings, in statues, and in pictures. Art is itself a very great word and means many things. It is applied to style and writing, to musical compositions, and even to effective eloquence, as well as to architecture, sculpture, and painting. We speak of music as artistic, and not foolishly, of an artistic poet or an artistic writer like Voltaire or Macaulay, of an artistic preacher, by which we mean 
that each and all move the sensibilities and souls and minds of men by adherence to certain harmonies which accord with fixed ideas of grace beauty and dignity eternal ideas which the mind conceives are the foundation of art as they are of philosophy art claims to be creative and is in a certain sense inspired like the genius of a poet however material the creation the spirit which gives beauty to it is of the mind and soul imagination is tasked to its utmost stretch to portray sentiments and passions in the way that makes the deepest impression the marble bust becomes animated and even the temple consecrated to the deity becomes religious in proportion as these suggest the ideas and sentiments which kindle the soul to admiration and awe these feelings belong to everyone by nature and are most powerful when most felicitously called out by the magic of the master who requires time and labor to perfect his skill art is therefore popular and appeals to everyone but to those most who live in the great ideas on which it is based the peasant stands awestruck before the majestic magnitude of a cathedral the man of culture is roused to enthusiasm by the contemplation of its grand proportions or graceful outlines or bewitching details but he sees in them the realization of his ideas of beauty grace and majesty which shine forever in unutterable glory indestructible ideas which survive all thrones and empires and even civilizations they are as imperishable as stars and suns and rainbows and landscapes since these unfold new beauties as the mind and soul rest upon them whenever then man creates an image or a picture which reveals these eternal but indescribable beauties and calls forth wonder or enthusiasm and excites refined pleasures he is an artist he impresses to a greater or less degree every order and class of men he becomes a benefactor since he stimulates exalted sentiments which after all are the real glory and pride of life and the cause of all happiness and virtue in cottage or in palace amid hard toils as well as in luxurious leisure he is a self-sustained man since he revels in ideas rather than in praises and honors like the man of virtue he finds in the adoration of the deity he worships his highest reward michelangelo worked preoccupied and rapt without even the stimulus of praise to an advanced old age even as dante lived in the visions to which his imagination gave form and reality art is therefore not only self-sustained but lofty and unselfish it is indeed the exalted soul going forth triumphant over external difficulties jubilant and melodious even in poverty and neglect rising above all the evils of life reveling in the glories which are impenetrable and living for the time in the realm of deities and angels the accidents of earth are no more to the true artist striving to reach and impersonate his ideal of beauty and grace than furniture and tapestries are to a true woman seeking the beatitudes of love and it is only when there is this soul longing to reach the excellence conceived for itself alone that great works have been produced when art has been prostituted to pander to perverted tastes or has been stimulated by thirst for gain then inferior works only have been created fra angelico lived secluded in a convent when he painted his exquisite madonnas it was the exhaustion of the nervous energies consequent on superhuman toils rather than the luxuries and pleasures which his position and means afforded which killed raphael at thirty-seven the artists of Greece did not live for utilities any more than did the Ionian philosophers, but in those glorious thoughts and creations which were their chosen joy. Whatever can be reached by the unaided powers of man was attained by them. They represented all that the mind can conceive of the beauty of the human form and the harmony of architectural proportions. In the realm of beauty and grace, modern civilization has no prouder triumphs than those achieved by the artists of pagan antiquity grecian artists have been the teachers of all nations and all ages in architecture sculpture and painting how far they were themselves original we cannot tell we do not know how much they were indebted to egyptians phoenicians and assyrians but in real excellence they have never been surpassed in some respects their works still remain objects of hopeless imitation in the realization of ideas of beauty and form they reached absolute perfection Hence, we have a right to infer that art can flourish under pagan as well as Christian influences. It was a comparatively pagan age in Italy when the great artists arose who succeeded da Vinci, especially under the patronage of the Medici and the Medician popes. Christianity has only modified art by purifying it from sensual attractions. 
christianity added very little to art until cathedrals arose in their grand proportions and infinite details and until artists sought to portray in the faces of their saints and madonnas the seraphic sentiments of christian love and angelic purity art even declined in the roman world from the second century after christ in spite of all the efforts of christian emperors in fact neither christianity nor paganism creates it it seems to be independent of both and arises from the peculiar genius and the circumstances of an age make art a fashion honor and reward it crown its great masters with olympic leaves direct the energies of a age or race upon it and we probably shall have great creations whether the people are christian or pagan so that art seems to be a human creation rather than a divine inspiration it is the result of genius stimulated by circumstances and directed to the contemplation of ideal excellence much has been written on those principles upon which art is supposed to be founded but not very satisfactorily although great learning and ingenuity have been displayed it is difficult to conceive of beauty or grace by definitions as difficult as it is to define love or any other ultimate sentiment of the soul metaphysics mathematics music and philosophy says cleghorn have been called in to analyze define demonstrate or generalize great critics like burke allison and stewart have written interesting treatises on beauty and taste plato represents beauty as the contemplation of the mind leibniz maintained that it consists in perfection diderot referred beauty to the ideal of relation blondel asserted that it was in harmonic proportions lee speaks of it as the music of the age these definitions do not much assist us we fall back on our own conceptions or intuitions as probably did phidias although art in greece could hardly have attained such perfection without the aid which poetry and history and philosophy alike afforded art can flourish only as the taste of the people becomes cultivated and by the assistance of many kinds of knowledge the mere contemplation of nature is not enough savages have no art at all even when they live amid grand mountains and beside the ever-changing sea when phidias was asked how he conceived his olympian jove he referred to homer's poems michelangelo was enabled to paint the saints and the sibyls of the sistine chapel from familiarity with the writings of the jewish prophets isaiah inspired him as truly as homer inspired phidias the artists of the age of phidias were encouraged and assisted by the great poets historians and philosophers who basked in the sunshine of pericles even as the great men in the court of elizabeth derived no small share of their renown from her glorious appreciation great artists appear in clusters and amid the other constellations that illuminate the intellectual heavens they all mutually assist each other when rome lost her great men art declined when the egotism of louis the fourteenth extinguished genius the great lights in all departments disappeared so art is indebted not merely to the contemplation of ideal beauty but to the influence of great ideas permeating society such as when the age of phidias was kindled with the great thoughts of socrates democritus thucydides euripides aristophanes and others whether contemporaries or not a sort of augustan or elizabethan age never to appear but once among the same people now in reference to the history or development of ancient art until it culminated in the age of pericles we observe that its first expression was in architecture and was probably the result of religious sentiments when nations were governed by priests and not distinguished for intellectual life then arose the temples of egypt of assyria of india they are grand massive imposing but not graceful or beautiful they arose from blended superstition and piety and were probably erected before the palaces of kings and in egypt by the dynasty that builded the older pyramids even those ambitious and prodigious monuments which have survived everything contemporaneous indicate the reign of sacerdotal monarchs and artists who had no idea of beauty but only of permanence they do not indicate civilization but despotism unless it be that they were erected for astronomical purposes as some maintain rather than as sepulchres for kings but this supposition involves great mathematical attainments it is difficult to conceive of such a waste of labor by enlightened princes acquainted with astronomical and mathematical knowledge and mechanical forces for herodotus tells us that one hundred thousand men toiled on the great pyramid during forty years what for surely it is hard to suppose that such a pile was necessary for the observation of the polar star and still less probably was it built as a sepulchre for a king since no covered sarcophagus has ever been found in it nor have even any hieroglyphics 
the mystery seems impenetrable but the temples are not mysteries they were built also by sacerdotal monarchs in honor of the deity they must have been enormous perhaps the most imposing ever built by man witness the ruins of karnak a temple designated by the greeks as that of jupiter ammon with its large blocks of stone seventy feet in length on a platform one thousand feet long and three hundred wide its alleys over a mile in length lined with colossal sphinxes and all adorned with obelisks and columns and surrounded with courts and colonnades like solomon's temple to accommodate the crowds of worshippers as well as priests but these enormous structures were not marked by beauty of proportion or fitness of ornament they show the power of kings not the genius of a nation they may have compelled awe they did not kindle admiration the emotion they called out was such as is produced now by great engineering exploits involving labor and mechanical skill not suggestive of grace or harmony which require both taste and genius the same is probably true of solomon's temple built at a much later period when art had been advanced somewhat by the phoenicians to whose assistance it seems he was much indebted we cannot conceive how that famous structure should have employed one hundred and fifty thousand men for eleven years and have cost what would now be equal to two hundred million dollars from any description which has come down to us or any ruins which remain unless it were surrounded by vast courts and colonnades and ornamented by a profuse expenditure of golden plates which also events both power and money rather than architectural genius after the erection of temples came the building of palaces for kings equally distinguished for vast magnitude and mechanical skill but deficient in taste and beauty showing the infancy of art yet even these were in imitation of the temples and as kings became proud and secular probably their palaces became grander and larger like the palaces of nebuchadnezzar and rameses the great and the persian monarchs at susa combining labor skill expenditure dazzling the eye by the number of columns and statues and vast apartments and yet still deficient in beauty and grace it was not until the greeks applied their wonderful genius to architecture that it became the expression of a higher civilization and as among egyptians art in greece is first seen in temples for the earlier greeks were religious although they worshipped the deity under various names and in the forms which their own hands did make the dorians who descended from the mountains of northern greece eighty years after the fall of troy were the first who added substantially to the architectural art of Asiatic nations by giving simplicity and harmony to their temples. We see great thickness of columns, a fitting proportion to the capitals, and a beautiful entablature. The horizontal lines of the architrave and cornice predominate over the vertical lines of the columns. The temple arises in the severity of geometrical forms. The Doric column was not entirely a new creation, but was an improvement on the Egyptian model less massive more elegant fluted increasing gradually towards the base with a slight convex swelling downward about six diameters in height superimposed by capitals so regular was the plan of the temple that if the dimensions of a single column and the proportion of the entablature should bear to it were given to individuals acquainted with this style with directions to compose a temple they would produce designs exactly similar in size arrangement and general proportions and yet while the style of all the doric temples is the same there are hardly two temples alike being varied by the different proportions of the column which is the peculiar mark of grecian architecture even as the arch is the feature of gothic architecture the later doric was less massive than the earlier but more rich in sculptured ornaments the pedestal was from two-thirds to a whole diameter of a column in height built in three courses forming as it were steps to the platform on which the pillar rested the pillar had twenty flutes with a capital of half a diameter supporting the entablature this again two diameters in height was divided into architrave frieze and cornice but the great beauty of the temple was the portico in front a forest of columns supporting the pediment above which had at the base an angle of about fourteen degrees from the pediment the beautiful cornice projects with various moldings while at the base and at the apex are sculptured monuments representing both men and animals the graceful outline of the columns and the variety of light and shade arising from the arrangement of the mouldings and capitals produced an effect exceedingly beautiful all the glories of this order of architecture culminated in the parthenon 
built of pentelic marble resting on a basement of limestone surrounded with forty-eight fluted columns of six feet and two inches diameter at the base and thirty-four feet in height the frieze and pediment elaborately ornamented with reliefs and statues while within the cella or interior was the statue of minerva forty feet high built of gold and ivory the walls were decorated with the rarest paintings and the cella itself contained countless treasures this unrivaled temple was not so large as some of the cathedrals of the middle ages but it covered twelve times the ground of the temple of solomon and from the summit of the acropolis it shone as a wonder and a glory the marbles have crumbled and its ornaments have been removed but it has formed the model of the most beautiful buildings of the world from the quirinius at rome to the madeline at paris stimulating alike the genius of michelangelo and christopher wren immortal in the ideas it has perpetuated and immeasurable in the influence it has exerted who has copied the flavian amphitheatre except as a convenient form for exhibitors on the stage or for the rostrum of an orator who has not copied the parthenon as the severest in its proportions for public buildings for civic purposes the ionic architecture is only a modification of the doric its columns more slender and with a greater number of flutes and capitals more elaborate formed with volutes or spiral scrolls while its pediment the triangular facing of the portico is formed with a less angle from the base the whole being more suggestive of grace than strength vitruvius the greatest authority among the ancients says that the greeks in inventing these two kinds of columns imitated in the one the naked simplicity and aspects of a man and in the other the delicacy and ornaments of a woman whose ringlets appear in the volutes of the capital. The Corinthian order, which was the most copied by the Romans, was still more ornamented, with foliated capitals, greater height, and a more decorated entablature. End of section 14